Tor Bay is a gorgeous little bit of beachside loveliness located on Auckland's North Shore. It is home to 13,500 residents and the community is growing by the day with the addition of 2,500 new homes planned in the neighbouring Long Bay in the next decade. My father is from the island of Mauritius and my mum is Welsh. And after 20 years spent traveling the world working on board cruise ships as an entertainment officer, I've decided Tor Bay is the place I'm gonna put down my roots. I'm just one member of a colorful community here. And in today's episode of Neighborhood, we're gonna find out exactly what makes this place unique. We'll see the way treasured heirlooms still influence the life of a young Japanese woman. Even though I love New Zealand, I still, in part of me, is Japan. Yes, I think it's will never, it will go away. A South African-born artist shares the inspiration she draws from her childhood. My parents were political in that they were very aware of what was happening, and they would do what they knew was the right thing, which is to treat people with dignity. We'll discover the way a long-term Torbay resident helps newcomers to the community. Every week is different. Um, there's no real set piece to it. We just go in, we make teas and coffees, we have homemade cake, and we just get into small groups and chat. And a man from Burundi passes on his recipe for success to the next generation. It is exactly like um, how my mum used to make it. So I uh, obviously follow all, every single step. I'm Adam Godair, and this is my neighborhood. Dad arrived in the UK in the 60s to work as a nurse. He was posted to a hospital in a small town in Wales, where he met my mum. She was just 17 when they married and had me. Dad was 11 years older. Now, mum was one of seven. She was the only girl in her family of brothers. And not all the family were too thrilled about the union, if I was to be honest. Dad stuck out like a sore thumb in the small town of Carmarthen, and people would stare. But I guess it really wasn't the time or place where people celebrated their cultural heritage or embraced what it was about their family that made them unique. Torbay couldn't be more different. I was born in Kagoshima, southern part of Japan. When I came to New Zealand, I was 10 years old with my parent and my little sister. The reason we moved here was to have a really good education because um, Japan was too busy for us to live freely. So my parents wanted to give us the opportunity to choose our own life. I moved back to Japan when I finished university because until then, like, I didn't come to New Zealand by my own decision. And I felt, um, I, I always felt I lost something, part of me. I came from the, the samurai family. Uh, we are, our family is, the root is, uh, of the samurai, and well, our um, housing hometown is really um, traditional um, samurai house, surrounded by lots of um, old um, historical uh, yeah, uh, things, um, uh, furniture, and everything. This is the bowl we use for special ceremony in New Year's Eve. And this, um, we pour our special broth in this bowl. It's in our family for over 
50, 60 years old and has the family symbols in the, on the back of the lid. It's the picture of two butterflies facing together. Even though I love New Zealand and I, I live longer in New Zealand now, but I still, in part of me, like the base bottom is Japan. And yes, I think it will never ever go away. When I have this bros, the, the first thing I see is my family symbol when I open the bros. This is my favorite dish. Everything is here. Reminds me of my home. Yes, I used to hate this broth uh, when I was kids, but when I when I grown up, see uh, how precious is the the family is. We decided to start our own coffee shop, Ark Coffee Company. Yeah, my sister asked me to design the logo. And the first thing popped up in my mind was our family symbol, the two butterflies facing together. This is fourth year now, this year. And uh, well, the concept is about uh, my sister roasting coffee and me, I'm the artist, so I um, do all the art. I meet different people at the cafe and so many people are immigrants from all over the world. And it is really interesting to people talk about their own country and Yes, they come to New Zealand in different reasons, but they still, many of them still love their own culture and country. And I'm the same, and I always want to keep remember and remind myself about Japan. Mauritius started out as a Dutch Republic. It then became a French colony, the Isle de France. <laughs> but it truly is a multilingual trading port. My uncle there speaks eight languages. But when dad came to the UK, it was all about assimilation. So dad never passed on any of his languages he spoke onto us kids. So all we ever knew was English. My grandmother from Mauritius who came to stay with us only spoke Creole and Pigeon French, so we had zero common ground. But I knew when she was cross because she couldn't get to the drawer fast enough to get out the wooden spoon. I don't think you really need words for that or figure out what's gonna happen next. But I think it really hurt her deep down that she couldn't communicate with us in her loving and meaningful way or have a conversation with her daughter-in-law about life. Language can be such a great barrier or a bridge, especially when you're in another country trying to get to know people. My husband Keith spent his whole career as a nuclear physicist working for the atomic energy authorities. After he retired, that is when we decided to come here with the whole intention of leading a wonderfully retired, relaxing life. One of our sons had already moved here, so we'd been out several times on holiday, and then we decided that we would come, and one of our daughters came with us at that time. Subsequently, all the others have joined us here, and we all live in Torbay. When we first came here, we loved the weather, uh, first and foremost. 
how clean it is and the multiculturalism. Uh, the area we lived in in England uh, was on the south coast and it was very white and middle class and I just loved all the different cultures and nationalities here. It made life so interesting. I became aware that other immigrants were not as, as fortunate to have the family as we had. And an instance happened when a Korean lady moved in opposite me. And I, I made a cake and a card and went over and said hi. And um, in subsequent days, we joined each other for coffee. And she said how lonely she was. English second language is very isolating. And it was because of her that I actually started the coffee group nine years ago. And so the coffee group, the International Coffee Group, was formed for people to come along, to be able to make friends, to be able to practice English. And we, 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 we don't teach them, we're not a school or any sort, but we will help them with different things like explaining jokes, because plays on words are very difficult for English second language people to actually understand. Yes. Dan, Danny had told me he had bought uh, mm, the house. I think Danny, a very, very like in Lao, everybody, mum, everybody. <laughs> they come along if they're new to the area, just helps them connect with other people and make friends. We've got one lady this morning who has only been in the country seven weeks from South Africa. How do you, if you haven't small children at school where you meet at the school gate, how do you actually connect with people and start to interface with others and, and make friends? So this is the place to do it. I'm not really from China, but we do take Chinese tea in Malaysia. No milk. No. And no sugar. And yeah, and no sugar. Just the cheese in the Yes, you thing. just yeah. brew the and they have different types of leaves. Every week is different. Um, there's no real set piece to it. We just go in, we make teas and coffees, we have homemade cake, and we just get into small groups and chat. Anyone who's got a hobby will bring their hobby stuff along, show and tell. We've all taken our wedding dresses along, our wedding photos, and shared them between or the whole group because we're interested in each other's lives. I like to make people feel at home. So it wasn't that I come here to, you know, uh, sort of uh, get new friends or what, but I want to come here to be a friend. Because when I first came, it's tough when you don't have friends. So I know what it's like when you're new to a country. It's sort of like a, a sister. You grow like a sister. You unite like sisters, yes. And you look forward to having come together and have, you know, have a, a chat with your sister. And... Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. I think out of all the things I have done, the thing I am most proud of is the International Coffee Group. Um, it's a huge commitment every single week, week in, week out, making the cakes, going there, getting the chairs out, putting them away. And sometimes, you know, when you, you're getting weary at the end of the year, but it still carries on because some of those people, you know, that is a lifeline to them. Kids can be quite harsh and quite cruel. I mean, growing up on a council estate with 80 or 90 terraced houses and all the kids are white, and in the summer they really couldn't understand why your suntan would be so much better than theirs. I mean, I would be a lovely golden brown and they would be bright red. My parents split up when I was in my teens, around about 12, and I just think their cultural backgrounds just proved to be a little bit too much. I left home at the age of 16, and I had my own flat by the age of 17. And that was tough, you know, learning to cook, pay bills, and survive on your own at such a young age. But I was always drawn to show business and entertainment, 
and for 20 years I travelled the world working on board cruise ships as a cruise director where I met my beautiful Kiwi wife and she was a professional dancer in the shows. Sometimes throwing yourself into something creative can give you such a great perspective on life. This is my grandfather Frank Biggs's painting, Palette Knife, and um, it's the front path leaving the homestead um, of the farm that I grew up on and he purchased when my dad was six. I was born in South Africa in a place called Hrafrenet, which is just about centre. Eastern Cape, semi-desert area, Lovely. My parents were political in that they were very aware of what was happening. And my mother speaks of it, she spoke of it this way. She said, we would sit and agonize at the fireplace, at the fire in the winter for hours as to whether we should go because they weren't in agreement with what the then regime was, was inflicting on the country. And so they agreed to stay and give the next generation the decision to leave if they so wanted to, but that they would do what they knew was the right thing, which is to treat people with dignity and respect, which they always did. They were good people, my mom and dad, yeah. We came to New Zealand in 1995, um, my husband and myself and our three children. I think my work has changed quite a bit since I moved to New Zealand. The light here is very different. The light in South Africa is clear, but it's not as crisp as here. I think where, where I was too, even in Johannesburg, there would be smog or dust. Dust, I think, would tone it. So you always had beautiful sunsets. You, you need dust in the air for, for your sunset, you know? My studio is a shared space, which used to be a garage, and I now share it with my husband, which is not always very good. I like listening to loud music and he likes to be businesslike when he talks on the phone, so I've got to turn my music down. <laughs> Coming from Africa, the colours of the rocks and the soil, it's, a bit, it's not as definite as Australia, but it's especially where the, my farm, where family farm is, there's, there's subtleties and um, but there is colour. I sometimes work by referring to drawings, and there would be something in the drawing that gives me the hint of, of where the work should be going. Yeah, I think art does definitely run in the family. Or well, with a twin sister who's an architect and mm. an older sister who's a graphic designer, myself as a painter and sculptor, so it's all very much here. That's Africa for me. It's too obvious, I suppose, in many ways, um, but the colours, it's, it's all about the colours and... I don't know, no, the textures. Yes, I, I, I like stripes. They're um, very calming. I mean, there's a number of these that I think I've actually started on without you knowing. I think I you pretended know. not to notice. I know. <laughs> and just quietly fixed them up. Oh. oh. <laughs> yeah, when I was a kid, I did that all the time. I think a lot of those old ones up there. It was from my first solo exhibition. Horses and the Avenging Angel and... It was actually a very nice show. 
It reminds me of a documentary I was watching on cricket where Chris Gale talked about the significance of the Rastafarian colours in African culture. Ah, uh, okay. Yes. He's saying the, <laughs> the green is for the land itself, the gold is for the gold that was taken, and the red is for the blood of the people. So, fairly significant, I think. Isn't that interesting how the different generations take different takes? Yeah. Would my artwork be different if I had a different background? Yes, I would imagine it would. In fact, I'm quite sure it would. My dad has never been back to the island of Mauritius, but I was lucky enough to talk there one time on a cruise ship I was working on. I had a chance to catch up with my aunties, uncles, and all of my cousins. But I never got to grips with how it must have felt for my father to leave his family so far behind. Now I'm the only one living on an island with my family so far behind. My commitment now to my two boys is to work hard and provide them with a loving, solid family home and to be an active part of their lives. It's one of the most important things I'd like to pass down to the next generation. I was born in Burundi. It's, uh, it's this lovely country in the uh, central east, eastern part of Africa. Life in the village was beautiful. You knew everybody in the village. Uh, people grew their own food. There, were, there was no such thing as a stranger in that village. Originally, I was a teacher. I used to teach children. And then um, I also moved on to um, working with um, uh, conservationists. I worked at uh, Jen Goro Institute. Jen Goro is a primatologist uh, who started doing research on chimpanzees back in the um, very, very early 60s. Oh, Jen is one of those inspirational people and uh, it was amazing actually to be associated with her work. And she's got her way of conveying a message to people who don't possibly understand or who might resist in what she's about to say. I've got some of the photos um, from Burundi back in the days when we were looking after those orphan chimps. That's me with the kids up only a few months after we got him to the centre. That was yeah, quite precious there. I think it was one of those things where you question yourself, what am I doing which can help so that we can have a better environment to live in? Looking after a baby chimp is like looking after a baby human, uh, perhaps even one step further because they, you, you feel sorry, they've lost their, their mothers and the, the, the entire family, so you had to be there for them. So it was very, very much like dedication, 100%. Now, that's a photo of Keza when I visited um, that sanctuary six years later, after he hadn't seen me and he recognized me and he came, um, came towards me by extending his hand and I also extended mine, and it was quite emotional right there. I left Burundi um, when I went to further uh, to, to do more, um, to, le to learn more about conservation, and I was fortunate enough to go to uh, UK. In Burundi in the uh, mid-90s, there were lots of uh, political unrest and there was a civil war and uh, people got displaced. I, I was unable to go back because of that uh, prevailing situation in Burundi at the time. But I was also very, very blessed to come to New Zealand and started um, life in New Zealand.
It is absolutely good to share the African culture with family and friends. And any, anything you can pass on in terms of culture, we really, really have to uh, keep working hard so that we can keep the culture alive wherever we are, because it's part of who we are. So we're gonna make ugali, which is uh, cassava flour. Now, cassava is um, predominantly grown in the equatorial belt of Africa. It's a tuber, so it's been dried and grounded and then uh, made into flour. So the, what we're doing now is uh, put the flour in here, and then once the, we're gonna put it on a boiling water and start mixing until it has uh, its consistency, until it's firm and ready so it will look like a dough. You then start mixing, so we're kind of ready to mix. And you kind of ensure that you don't uh, have too much heat in there. Essentially what you're doing is um, keep an eye on the consistency. Jamie Oliver style where you don't have the exact measurement, throw this in and throw that in until you're happy with the consistency. And make sure that all the flour is thoroughly mixed and there's no lumps. It is exactly like um, how my mom used to make it. So I uh, obviously follow all, every single step. I live with my lovely family. I live with my wife, Rachel, and my daughter, our daughter, Aisha. Mmm, that's delicious. Thanks, guys. Pleasure. Yeah. Uh, everybody has hopes and dreams, and mine is to really see kind of communities looking after each other and looking looking after where they live, uh, because we're gonna leave it behind, and it will be. It's one of those things. It will be an honor for the people who come after us to say, oh. The people, the people who were here before, they actually did look after what we have and we've got some sort of legacy to show. Torbay has been a fantastic place for us to put down roots. I mean, I really like the relaxed atmosphere, the community feel, and we have fantastic neighbours around us. The summers feel endless and the beach is just glorious. It's wonderful for me to know that my kids are going to have an amazing time growing up here, that no one's going to ever give them grief for being different, and they'll be part of a diverse and accepting community. Torbay, it feels like home to me. This program was made with funding from New Zealand On Air.